Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you here this morning. If you would, get your green hymn books and turn to page 33. Page 33. Forget that whatever you sow, you're going to reap. 
Well, the good and bad, whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. And they forget about God. They forget about it. One day you're going to stand before God. Period. I mean, that is absolute fact. One day each one of us will appear before God and we'll give an account to God for our life. I mean, that's just Bible one-on-one. But not only do they forget about God and His judgment, they forget about God and His Son. Now, that's what really gets us in trouble when we forget about Jesus. The only way I can get to God is through Jesus. The only way I can get to God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And they carry that up a step further. And the day folks just... The, Hard to get folks to come to church. I thank God for the good crowd we've got here today. But you know, uh, my goodness, look how many empty pews we've got. We've got five or six empty pews. Think of how many more people that should be here, that could be here, that's missing out on the singing and, and the other things that goes on in the church. Forget about the church and forgetting about the Lord's day. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also, also reap. Every farm boy knows that. How many of you used to get a current event when you was in the third or fourth or fifth or sixth grade? Lord me, I'm on the old head here. I reckon these current events, you'd get them at cost 15 cents a year. We talk about the middle 50s now. Or maybe further back than that. And uh, you'd get reports out of the articles. And in one of those things, the question was asked, to a group of fifth graders up north. Now this is the middle fifties. Where did milk come from? Uh, they said out of the fossil. <laughs> my, my fifth grade class, we cracked up over that. We thought, man, how dumb can you be? Milk come out of come out of the come out of the fossil. But look what the Bible says about the sea. The Bible says, first of all, be not deceived. Now the devil will try to deceive you. And then there's two directions he'll go in trying to deceive. First of all, think of Gideon. Remember God called Gideon? And God said to Gideon, I want you to deliver Israel out of front of the enemies. And you know what Gideon said? Well, on me, Lord, you don't know who you're talking to. I'm the least. I'm the run of the letter. I'm from the poorest of poor. Now, where did he get that kind of thing? From the devil. You know, the first thing the devil will try to do, he'll make, try to make you look like you ain't worth a flip. That you are the least of the lowest and the low down of the lowest. That's what the devil will try to do to you. But what did God say? God said, you're what I want. You're what I need. Listen, you are what God wants. You are what God needs. Whatever you may see your fault says, bring them to God. And God will use those for His honor and, and His glory. Now let's get on the other side of the coin. Thou Simeon, remember him in Samaria. He watches as Simon Peter lays his hands upon those Samaritans and they receive the Holy Ghost. He watches as, as, they, as they perform the miracles and he says to Peter, Peter, sell me some of that Holy Ghost. <coughs> sell me some of it. And Simon Peter said, listen, I see right now, man, you in the gall of iniquity. You ain't grew a bit. You may know Jesus as your Savior, but buddy, you have got a lot to learn. See, the next thing the devil will try to do to you, he'll say, you use religion for your benefit. Folks, the church ain't here for my benefit. The church really ain't here for your benefit. It is here that we can reach out and win people to the Lord and people Amen. can come and share the Word of God together and grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, first of, first of all, he says, God is not mocked. Now we think of mocking today as mimicking somebody, but that's really not what he's talking about. He's talking about fooling God. You cannot fool God. You can't fool God for two reasons. First of all, God knows all and God sees all. Now, you may fool your family. They may think you are the smartest dude and you are, you're, you're heaven's next kind of guy or girl. But listen, God knows your heart. Amen. God knows you fool your friends. I mean, you have them thinking you are absolutely all it is. You hung the moon. But listen, God knows how, how it really, really is. We are concerned about what people think, aren't we? 
How many of you have ever slipped down on, uh, when it was iced over? I slipped down in the parking lot at Food Lane. I mean, <coughs> there I went. You know the first thing I did when I got up? I looked around to see if anybody saw me. But you know what I didn't look? I didn't look up because I already knew God saw me. God saw me. And so we want to hide things from folks. We want to, well, we, we want people to think good of us. And then we can't fool God because He has all power. Let me tell you what you are in the hands of God. You're a piece of clay. God can mold you into anything you will let Him make you. God can mold you into the most dynamic Christian that most people have ever seen. God can mold you to good, to good things. But you know, here's the thing. God has a power and to bring us to judgment. Every one of us, without exception, will stand before God and give an account for His life. At this one church that's in a midst of revival, good revival going on, one of the ladies had something delivered one day and she said to the delivery fellow, she said, now listen, why don't you come to church down at so-and-so church? We're having a great revival. He looked up toward the sky and said, oh, I can't come, it's supposed to rain. She wisely said, well, young man, it's not going to be raining on judgment day. And that's exactly right. We can come up with all of our, all of our excuses, all of our excuses. But the sobering thought is this. One day, I must stand before God and I must give an account for the works done in the flesh. But now there's another thing he says. You know, God is not lost. But whatsoever you sow, whatsoever you sow, you're going to reap. You're going to reap what you sow. First of all, we reap in our daily lives what we sow right here. See, it's like a detective. See, it's like a detective. It's on our trail. When we sin, that sin gets on our trail. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Doesn't mean that everybody on Facebook don't know what you did. But it means this. On judgment day, all hidden will be, will be revealed. It seems to me like that uh, as we think about this thing of sowing and reaping, we've got to be careful what we sow, haven't we? Because reaping is coming, is coming our way. Now, but not only that, we reap in the lives of others what we sow right here. Here is a tragedy and tragedy of sin. That we sin and in our mind the devil says you ain't hurt nobody but you. And the truth of the matter is you hurt everybody around you. Especially those ones that, that you love. A few years ago a man came in to the office and he sat there a minute and I know he was, he was acting a little strange. And he just laid his head right on my knees and began to weep. I mean, he began to cry like And he said, Lord Borden, he said, my son's in jail. They arrested me last night for being drunk. And he wept some more. And he said, what makes it so bad? I'm the one that gave him his first turn. I'm the one that helped the bottle to his mind the first time. We reap in the lives of others the sins that we sow down here. How many little boys and girls today, their minds are affected, their speech is affected. Some of them are in wheelchairs. Some of them will never have a normal life. All because a mom or dad was involved in drugs. You will reap. You will reap. In the lives of others. The sins that you say. But it seems to me like that we owe our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren. It seems to me like there's two things we owe. It seems to me like that we owe them to live the best we can for Christ. Amen. We owe them that. 
We owe them that. That is a debt that we need to pay. You know, the greatest gift we can give to our to our offspring, while they be children, grandchildren, or great grandchildren, or great great grandchildren, the greatest example we can give is a life that's been led for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no better example than that. It is responsibility that God put on me. He put it on you for us to live before. Him. Not only the world, but especially before our families, to our children, our offspring, to live like God would have us to live. Amen. Then we owe it to our children to try our best to lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, the church only has at best four hours a week. You have them 164 hours left. Listen. It is good that there are Sunday school teachers, there are vacation Bible school teachers, there are pastors, there are, there are youth ministers that lead boys and girls to the Lord. And I'm certainly not saying anything against that. That's great. But what I'm saying is, don't wait on somebody else. If you've got a child that's, that shows an interest in being saved and you've talked to and I'm talking about being saved, I'll tell you, you know what some people say, well, I'm going to let my child make up their own mind when it comes to religion. I'm telling you, that takes stupidity to a whole different level. It really does. I mean, you wouldn't go out and plant a garden and say, well, I'm going to let this garden make up its mind. It can grow whatever it wants to. No, you'd be out there. Listen, the devil will always, always take control if you leave it in, in, a, new, in a neutral gear. No, you've got to be positive about, about the thing. Let's suppose your child was down in the woods. It was nighttime. You wouldn't say... Y'all gonna just let him find his own way out of here. Or he's in a pit and you say, well, I'm just gonna let him climb out of here. You know what you'd do? You'd be going bananas. You'd call 911. You'd have those woods lit up like New York City. Folks, listen. If physical, if physical security is worth that much, how much more is spiritual security? No one that young one is on the way to heaven. The seed. What kind of seed do we sow? There are two kinds of seed that you can sow. First of all, there's what the Bible calls the sin of the flesh. The sin of the flesh. Think of sin like a fighter's well. He's out to get a fly. He builds his well. Here comes an innocent fly. Wham! He's caught. Sin is the same, same way. You know, they say that a little bit of dust on one of the big modern airplanes in the control systems can throw the navigation off a hundred miles. Just a little bit of sin in your life will get you plumb out of the will of God, plumb out of where you need to be. But sin not only, not only does sin seduce you, sin also brings with it sadness. All the sadness in the world today is a result of sin. Amen. All of it, even death, is a result of sin. Here's a happy home. Man and his wife and children going good. Sin comes in. Next thing you know, that home is torn apart. Those little children, they're empty eyed. They don't know. They don't have security. They don't have mom at home. They don't know where daddy's at. Why did he start with? He started with sin. Sin brings sadness. Not only that, sin leaves scars. Now God will forgive you for any sin. Y'all believe that? God will forgive you for any sin. God will forgive you no matter how far down the ladder you've got. But this is what God will not do. God will not remove the scars from your life. Don't listen. You'll go to the grave. Well, the scar sin has left upon your life. Not only does sin leave scars, sin separates us. Separates us. Suppose I went to the disciples after the resurrection and I said, where's Judas? And they said, he's out in the field. So I go out to the field to see Judas. And I see hanging from a, from a limb I see a rope hanging from a limb. And the body off the rope is gone. And I look down in the ravine. And there's Judas. All of his intestines are gushing out. How did this man get this away? How did this disciple of Jesus, how did this man who stayed with the Lord three and a half years, how did he get in this situation? 
He separated himself from the Lord. Listen, even though you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, that's good that you got heaven nailed down, but what you ain't got life nailed down. That's what going to church is all about and reading your Bible and so forth. Now look at chapter 5, verse 19. Listen to what it says. Now the works of the flesh are manifested, which are. Now here's what sin. Here's the sins you'll be involved in. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, barrenness, immolation, wrath, strife, seduction, and heresy. Every sin you never commit will fall in one of those categories, and that's where sin takes you to. Now that's a bad sin. You sow bad seeds, you're going to reap bad consequences. But here's a good seed. Verse 22 talks about, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, against which is there no law. No one's not going to get arrested for being meek. Not going to get arrested for being sweet. Not going to get arrested for having joy in your life. A life is lived by the Lord. This is a fruit. Listen, if there's any one thing I want in my life, and I've reached the age now that I pray that God would give me peace in my life. That I might be able to spend these how many years I got left. That I might have peace in my life and, and a sweetness about my personality. But now there's a third thing. There is a season between between the sowing and the harvest. Every farm boy knows that. We call it lay-by time. Y'all remember that? Amen. Man, talk about joyful time. Lean back on the front porch, pick your guitar. You sleep all the way to 5.30 if you want to before you got up. Just have a good time. God had to be that period of time past by. Whatever you did didn't make a lot of difference. You just had to wait. Now then, he said, no. Two things you got to remember in this period of time. Number one, don't get worried. Don't get worried. That is, don't get negative. Don't get negative about things. You see, sometimes Christians are the worst people in the world to get negative. The least little thing. Everything about God's positive. Everything about God is up here. Everything about God is sweet and nice, you see. So he said, don't be weary. Don't get negative. The cure for that is if you get through yourself get negative, you go out and tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. You tell them about your faith. You tell them about when God saved you. That will cure. But he said, okay, first of all, don't get worried. Then he said, don't faint. Now, we think of fainting as a guy says he just collapses. We saw Brother Elliot illustrate today. It's okay. <laughs> we just think of him just. But really, that's not what the word of the faith means. Quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit what you're doing. So he said, don't, don't, uh, don't get negative and don't quit. The victory is to those who stay faithful. The victory in life and having a good life. Having a joyful life, let, let all the fruits of the Spirit be part of your life is to stay faithful to God and stay faithful to the Lord's house. But there's one more thing. You reap what you sow. This is a law of nature. If I go out and plant corn, what am I going to reap? Corn. If I go out and plant cotton, what am I going to reap? I'm going to reap cotton. And the same thing is true in Christian life. We, you reap whatever is sowed in the spiritual realm. It's amazing to me how God takes little things and uses them. Think about in the Bible, the little things that God took and, and wrote in His book about the little bitty things. Here is Mary anointing the feet of Jesus. But let me give you a better one than that. Here's Rhoda. All Rhoda does she opens the door for Simon Peter to get into the house and she had problems doing that. She thought he was a ghost. I, I've always thought Peter standing at the door and knocking. Rhoda coming and looking out. Just a ghost. She goes back and tells the crowd, Hey, hey, guess what? They must have already killed Simon Peter. And his ghost is there. Here's Simon Peter knocking on the door and somebody said, Can a ghost knock on the door? Just get this. 
The Bible wrote her name down for that one simple thing. A, a young man that spoke at the pastor's conference a week or so ago was telling about uh, he had stayed in the church five years and in that five years there was a death in the community and he went out of the house and sat in the church and talked to the lady who had lost her son about five minutes. He said he went back there five years to do the homecoming and she sent word for him to be sure and come to her house. And he said he went and they sat on the front porch and they talked 30 minutes and she kept over and over and over telling him what a blessing it was that what, that what he did that day, coming and talking to her five minutes, five years he went by. Listen, the little things you do for people, the little kindness, the little ministry, people never do, never do get over that. They never do get over the little things you do. Sometimes we think, well, I can't do this, I can't do that. Listen, God takes a little bitty things. A little bitty things. A lot of people are negative in their thinking about what they can do. I can't do this, I can't do that. You ever thought about what, what you can't do, maybe exactly what God can do most week? Because when you get in that frame of mind, all of all self uh, self elevation is gone away. Most of us most of us like to die in our sleep. <laughs> Most of us would like to die in our sleep. But how we pass in this life is not in our hands. At least it shouldn't be in our hands. Not in our hands. And so there was a man who hated the church. Hated. Why would anybody hate the church? Hated the church. Hated preachers. Hated deacons. Anything to do with God. He hated. But guess what? These kind of folks die too. They die too. He woke up one night in the process of dying and said to his wife, Honey, he said, The demons everywhere, get them away from me. Get these demons away from me. They're trying to drag me. That morning at 5 o'clock, when he finally drew his last breath, he drew his last breath, screaming at the top of his voice for the deep demons. Turn loose. Folks, I don't die like that. I don't die like that. I want the sweet voice of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Say, child, come on. Come on. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. Look into the face of all those that's gone on before. This morning, how is it with you and God? How is it with you and God? Whatever you do this morning will affect the whole of the rest of your life. If you turn to deaf ear, to turn a cold heart, it'll affect the rest of life. If you'll humble down before God, if God has spoken a word to you and there's some instruction from Him, if you'll humble yourself before the hand of Almighty God, your life will never be the same. Your life will be shot down a total different stretch of road. Let's pray again. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that your promises you made about if we sow the good things, we'll reap good things. Lord, I pray this morning that there will be good seed sowed here this morning. Good things happen here in this invitation. Or that may manifest or not, people coming forward, that's up to you. But Lord, I pray the main thing is, Lord, that people would do whatever they feel like you would have them do in this invitation. Lord, there may be some folks here that need to become a part of this fellowship. They need to be here with the grow. They need to identify with us as members. There may be folks here, Lord, that don't know how they stand with you. They don't know if they're lost or not. God, they don't need to leave here like that. I pray, God, they'll come and confess Christ as their Savior. And sometimes, Lord, we just get a little dirt on us along the way. And we just need to come to the altar and refresh our commitment to you. Now, Lord, I ask that you would have your will and way in this service. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. 182.